want to cover a lot of things in just a very short period of time, so this will just be a, a little spice of each. First thing I want to talk about is the radial artery. It's not just for catheterization anymore. In May of, late May of this year, the, uh, all five, or all six actually, of the biggest radial artery versus saphenous vein trials were MERS. This isn't a meta-analysis, it's actually a, a combination of, a, a data combination uh, th uh, event. If you look at the slides on the right, they, they find that uh, the overall rate of death by carotid revascularization was better when radial arteries were used at, for one of the bypasses compared to a saphenous vein, typically into the left system. All of these patients got mammary arteries to the LAD still. Graft failure was significantly lower, and this was measured by um, arteriography at, uh, in 75%, and a little over 75% of both groups. And so patency rates are better in that, in that as well. So as compared with the use of saphenous vein grafts, the use of radial artery grafts for cabbage resulted in a lower race of, rate of adverse cardiac events and a higher rate of patency at five years of follow-up. So I think you will start to see surgeons uh, using this conduit more frequently. I think you should see bilateral mammary arteries used more commonly as a, aside from this. But I think uh, as cardiologists, you should actually be demanding some of this as well. Um, mechanical valves without Coumadin was a hope that we had. Um, in the past, the Realign trial, which looked at dimigotran versus Coumadin, was very unsuccessful. But a part of, about a, a PROACT trial, which involved 41 centers in the United States and, uh, and Canada and Europe, was uh, finished several years ago, and the long-term results of this are now available. There were two basic parts to this trial. The first type was what's called the high-risk group. And this, this, in this group, patients with aortic stenosis that got an onyx aortic valve, mechanical valve, were randomized either to uh, an INR goal of 2 to 3 or an INR goal of 1.5 to 2. If you look at the panel on the left, you can see that the bleeding rates were lower in the lower INR rates, but that did not, but there was no effect on uh, thrombo thromboembolic events. And so that device now has, that, that particular valve has an FDA label for running lower anticoagulation levels after three months in the 1.5 to 2 range. There was another part of this trial that we were part of as well, and that was a trial with very low risk patients, uh, normal sinus rhythm, decent ventricular function, only aortic, stenos only aortic valve replacement, few other criteria. And those patients were, ran and they were all tested for sensitivity for, to both aspirin and Plavix. And those patients, 200 of those patients, were randomized one to one to either a dual antiplatelet alarm or, uh, ion, or a Coumadin with an INR of two to three. The results of that were not as, uh, as, a, as a effective, and the FDA data safety monitoring uh, group actually stopped this trial. The, ble the bleeding rates uh, shown on the left were not significantly different between the two groups. However, the thrombotic ra rates uh, were, much, were significantly higher and continued the, cur the, the curves continued to separate out to six or seven or even eight years, and that trial has been stopped. Uh, inter two interesting points on this, 24% of the patients in the dual antiplatelet therapy were retested and found no longer to be to reactive to, uh, to, to, to Plavix, which may have played some role in this, even though they were responsive at the beginning of the trial. The other interesting fact is that 44% of the patients in the dual group were, were recommended to go back to, uh, dual, to, to Coumadin and actually declined. So dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with higher rates of thromboembolism and valve thrombosis compared with the control of the low-risk arm. Hybrid revascularization is becoming an interesting uh, interest in a number of, of uh, areas. The five-year results of a ro prospective randomized trial of 200 patients uh, from Europe has now been uh, published. That, that came out uh, earlier this year in, uh, in Jack. The uh, interesting results of uh, the interesting of this interesting results of this were that the freedom from all cause mortality and of most major adverse cardiac events were similar between the two groups. So there has been a lot of uh, resistance to some uh, to some uh, groups to taking a hybrid approach where the mammary artery or the anterior surface is, is revascularized with the LAD to get that benefit, and then rather than typically saphenous veins. Uh, they, they use a um, uh, approach with uh, drug eluting stents. That appears to be a safe result. The results are early, and it's uh, very selected patients. But this may be a, this may be an encouraging thing. So that the hybrid coronary vascularization appears to have a similar five-year all-cause mortality when compared with conventional coronary bypass grafting. One of the interesting things of this trial was that the incidence of revascularization at five years was 37% in the hybrid group, but 45% in the coronary bypass surgery group, much higher than other trials. That, that particular finding is not, uh, is not explained.
and will need further work. Currently, less than half percent of uh, bypass surgery in the United States is done as a hybrid revascularization. Um, some of the new technologies in uh, cardiovascular surgery are quite interesting. One of those is machine perfusion for heart transplantation. There are devices now that rather than uh, taking a heart out at a donor hospital, pl placing it in, in a cardioplegia solution in an ice storage, uh, there's, there's interest in perfusing those hearts with blood-based solutions or other solutions as well. The PROCEED trial, which uses a, a device from uh, Transmedics called the Organ Care System, perfuses hearts and as you can see in here, keeps the heart actually beating during that time. Uh, st this, the initial trial of this was, uh, was, was published in 2015 in The Lancet and showed that the, the device was able to maintain pretty normal coronary flows and pretty, enable, uh, pretty, uh, pretty normal aortic parameters. Also, they measured lactate concentrations and they, were, they did not change over the time of that thing or over the time of the study. Uh, uh, some preservations up to nine hours were done in, the, uh, in this control, uh, in, in the uh, machine perfusion arm of that. Um, but there has not, the, uh, the FDA did not grant approval for that device, and that device is actually does not have an FDA label yet. There has been interest, however, in expanding the clinical use of this device in what's called donation after circulatory death donors. These are donors who are not brain dead, but have irreversible causes. They're taken to an operating room, typically, where ventilatory support is stopped, and then they die within 20 to 30 minutes, and when, uh, when cardiac asystole is obtained, uh, two to five minutes later, the heart is, or is, uh, is uh, harvested. This leads to a greater ischemic burden on these uh, hearts. It's been used in other organs, but there has been now um, expanding use of this in heart transplantation as well. And this is a report of, uh, that came out in 2017 of 45 total patients of DCD uh, heart transplants. Those are the higher risk ones. The one year survival rate on those using this OCS device, organ care system device was 91%, which is very comparable. So I think that in the future we may start to see more interest in using these perfusion devices to try to get some of the higher risk donors used to increase the donor pool to enable us to treat some of the sickest patients that, uh, that we're faced with. Um, in, in, the, in the realm of pediatric cardiac surgery, we've moved even beyond neonatal cardiac surgery now into the fetal cardiac surgery realm. You can argue if this is surgery or if this is intervention, and I think it's really a combination of, of teams of uh, dedicated people from both, from all multiple different disciplines that really make this uh, happen now. But we're seeing now more and more uh, patients that are diagnosed, all, virtually all patients with the, uh, uh, the vast majority of patients with complex congenital heart disease can be diagnosed uh, prenatally. And many of the things, for example, for treatment of severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction that could progress to, very, to uh, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome and to systems, situations where the patient ends up with a single ventricle repair can now be probably avoided. Um, in, this, uh, in this demonstration here, and don't try this at home, please, no. the needle is going through the, the abdominal wall of the woman, then through the womb, and then later as it, it, the needle enters into the apex of the left ventricle of the developing fetus, a guide wire is then passed through that, through the ventricle, and out through the left ventricular outflow tract, and then a balloon is inflated in the outflow tract here to open up the annulus and increase the size of that. This is usually done at mid-gestation, and, this, and then uh, the, the hope is that the, the child then develops this chamber size and aortic size better so that a two-chamber repair can be, uh, can be done later on. So this is a, there's been a few hundred of these cases done worldwide now. I think this is going to be the next sort of frontier in, in uh, pediatric cardiac surgery. And lastly, I want to mention a little bit about uh, endovascular aortic repair. It's now pretty much the standard in abdominal aortic aneurysm and in descending and, and thoracoabdominal work as well. But now we're moving into zone zero and zone one in the ascending aorta and the transverse arch. This is really believed by most to be the final frontier. Several devices have been uh, looked at. The overall stroke rate in the early results, and most of this is very early, is around 10%, with maybe 7% major strokes and 3.5% 3, 3 minor strokes in this trial. That is what we are guiding patients in our uh, investigational uh, uh, device and device trials. This is one that, that we have used. This is a Cook A branch stent graft. Uh, the, the images are sent to Cook, and uh, a specialized uh, graft is produced, takes a period of several weeks, so there's no urgent cases that can be done with this, which has openings that line up with the arch vessels. 
Um, a tapered uh, mid-segment uh, mid is developed in this stent with a proximal and distal seal components designed specifically to the patient's anatomy from the, uh, uh, from the three DCDs that are sent in for the uh, development of these. This is an example. This is a case that uh, we did. This is actually the uh, second patient in the United States to get this device. And it shows in here a, a, a saccular type uh, aneurysm in the transverse arch. You can see a previous mitral uh, rep ring, a repair ring in there. Patients had previous heart surgery. But this device was designed for this patient, positioned in there, and uh, lined up. This has got the Phillips mask where you can, uh, you can merge the, the data from the CT and your uh, imaging at the same time. The device is deployed, and then uh, the device, you can see a, another component then being placed in the anominate artery here, and ultimately, they can see devices that are present, presented, uh, deployed in both the anominate artery, the left carotid, and the left subclavian, giving a complete arch reconstruction percutaneously and uh, covering all of the uh, stent there. And the final, res the final result looks like that with uh, complete uh, uh, coverage of the uh, aneurysm in the transverse arch. So these are some of the things that are coming up. Uh, I think that this is a very exciting field in cardiovascular medicine overall, and it's a great privilege to be a part of that, and I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. That was incredible. I mean, to see uh, the gambit of interventions from a fetal heart to this, you know, ginormous uh, aneurysm taken care of uh, percutaneously is amazing. I'm, I'm really glad too that uh, you know I got to see this because um, sadly I, I don't keep up as well in the on the uh, cardiac surgery literature. So uh, to know that you guys are are doing things like this is really impressive. So my uh, that, that was fascinating, and I I think for for me the one that's been impressive for me is the aortic work, and it's really a personalized medicine approach, right? Where it, right. really everybody gets their it's almost a personalized stint graft. Um, but I want to ask you about what's not on your list. Um, you know, really for the last five to 10 years, we've been, we have this huge number of patients with class three and class four heart failure, and this anticipated um, better total artificial hearts and total uh, pumps. So what's not on your list is advances in um, our uh, ability to have pumps to obviate the need for transplant. Yeah, I think that it's been a little bit slow development, I would say, in the last years. The only uh, artificial heart is the um, uh, Syncardia device right now. It is used very infrequently, a handful of cases in the United States. It's also going into the pediatric world as well. The one thing that is happening in the left ventricular assist devices is that there is more interest in certainly smaller devices and in devices uh, that, that do not have the um, same thrombotic problems as the initial pusher plate devices, so the, the continuous flow devices. And those trials are continuing, but the incremental change in those, I would agree, has been slower in the last few years. There's certain, but the one thing is there is certainly a huge number of patients that would benefit from those, and that's where I think a lot of work has to be done. Michael, can I put you on the spot and have your prediction for after low-risk TAVR trials come out, what the role of the cardiac surgeon will be in TAVR? Well, I, you know, we have a great program where we actually work very strongly with our team. I, think, I hope most pa places do, too. We cross the valves. We deploy them. So we, we, we want to see TAVR move forward, and we, we want to see that. The, the biggest thing for me in the low-risk trials is, um, the, is the young patient. And a 50-year-old 50, a 50 person who gets a TAVR will do well. His, if, it's, if it's just a one- or a two-year outcome, they will do at least as well as surgery, I believe. But what we don't know is the long-term um, uh, structural valve degeneration and how we will manage that in patients, whether we can go device in device or we can only do that once. But then if, if the device lasts eight years and then the next device lasts eight years, then I've got a 66-year-old man with two devices and a, and a bigger problem. So the long-term data is going to be very, very important for that. But we're excited about it. I really think this is going to help a lot of people. You know, a, a kind of, and he's a contentious guy, Paul Tierstein, uh, made the suggestion that after the low-risk trial comes out that it should be mandatory to get an interventional consult uh, for anybody with aortic valve disease rather than what we do uh, now, yeah. right? Uh, well, I think that, you know, we see a lot of people who actually ask for that in our uh, advanced valve clinic. 
But a young person, I often give them the guidance that, well, you're, you're likely, even today, you're likely to have a higher risk of paravalvar leak. You're likely to have a higher risk of a pacemaker. And you're likely to have, a, you're going to get a, a biologic valve that will require something else down the thing. And those are the big unknowns. Uh, compared to doing what we do now is the minimally invasive uh, operations where people are in hospital three or four days, get a standard valve and, and can do very well where we have 20, 20 or 25 year data on. So I think when the data comes out, it'll be easier to know. But I'm not ready to, uh, to advise the young people to, uh, to, to move into uh, TAVR as the first. And, and that may be the right way to go, to buy us enough time to get to a point where the 50, 60 year old person is now what we actually know about yeah. Uh, for Tabber. Yeah, a 50-year-old person, his next best 15 years are going to be the ones you, that he has right now. It's not going to be when he's 65. But so a lot of people want to have something minimally invasive, avoid anticoagulation and the problems with that. And I, and I get that. Um, but I just think we want to have something that, as people are living older, that is quite durable, too, or that at least we can manage any changes that occur downstream. Yeah. Hey, this is great. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend uh, Tim Henry, who's going to be talking with us. Sorry, sorry. Manos, yeah. Question, like, you know, there was a presentation just for the people because the radial is a big point that people go do the arterial vascularization. And I noticed your slide on the New England paper that looks fascinating. But we've had challenges convincing at least some of the surgeons to do arterial vascularization either with IMA or radials. Any thoughts on how this can change on the long term and the surgical? Well, I think it's going to get into the guidelines. The last 2011 guidelines, I, I was part of that committee that wrote that. And, and I don't think it was strong enough then. But I think that clearly now, any, any person that is a reasonable risk should be getting at least two arterial conduits into the left side. I'm hoping that will evolve through the guidelines and it may be even through STS quality metrics. But um, you know, I think that it is becoming pretty clear now that, the, the, that we can do better than the vein graphs that we are right now.